I'm Bridget Kremhout. And I'm Peter Shannon. You may have been able to guess that. I don't know. Maybe. Um, and yeah, we're here to talk to you about the chef and docker stuff that we're doing with Drama Fever. Yeah, welcome. Thanks for coming to our talk. Um, so yeah, some of you may know me. Um, I've had, I think, three or four people actually come up to me at ChefConf and say that they enjoyed Arrested DevOps, which is a podcast that um, I, I'm on with, a, with Trevor Hess and Matt Stratton of Chef, which is pretty awesome. So um, some of you know me from that. Some of you may know me from DevOps Days. Uh, where I, I organized one for Minneapolis. I have to put in a pitch. Our CFP is open until April 10th, so please put in a talk proposal. I know some of, some of you, possibly some of you in the front row already have, but put your proposals in, please, if you want to talk. And, uh, yeah. Yeah, and just to talk a little bit about myself, uh, I ride the Go bandwagon, love, love uh, writing Go code. I like working with data, and I uh, generally like doing all things ops, occasionally with zip ties. Fun fact... That is real, <laughs> and it is in our Philadelphia office in the back room, and uh, yeah, zip ties are great. It's a little bit terrifying. So yeah, we're both operations engineers for Drama Fever, um, and uh, if you're wondering what Drama Fever is, we're a streaming video site. Um, we're specializing in international content, uh, and a little bit more perspective on our content. I don't know if you want to go into that. Sure. So... We, uh, we deliver content from a variety of different countries, uh, primarily Korean and Japanese content, both TV, uh, TV shows and movies. Um, some of these numbers are a little outdated, but you can see you know, 15,000 episodes, uh, 70 content providers, and um, uh, here's some stats about uh, you know, our, our, our peak load, tens of thousands of requests per second, and uh, we have uh, uh, traffic variant swings uh, throughout the week, as would expect. Right, and since most of our audience is in uh, North America and to some extent Latin America, we have the sine wave that you would expect of how busy we are, um, time zones being what they are. People watch fewer K-dramas when they're sleeping. Not, not, not none, as it turns out, but fewer. Um, all right, so uh, we also, because we're, we're actually a streaming video platform at this point, we also run a couple of websites for AMC. They were one of our early investors and partners. And one is the Sundance Documentary Club, and another one is um, coming online uh, next month, which is Shudder, a horror site. It's just terrifying. It is terrifying. We, we can't even look at the images from it. Um, but uh, the interesting thing about that is that we power all three sites with the exact same code base. Uh, we're just you know, starting up containers with different environment variables, which is kind of cool. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about what kinds of stuff we have. Sure. So we're 100 percent in AWS. Um, we use Django. We have Go microservices, um, and you know, of course, other things like Nginx, Celery, SQS, and we deliver all our content through Akamai. Um, and uh, when Peter and I got hired, uh, I've been there about nine months. He's been there about six months, right. and we we're, you know, it's a pretty exciting ops opportunity. I know one of the reasons I took the gig was, hey, Docker and production and, and Go, this sounds fun. Let's do this great stuff. We have all sorts of cool stuff. And then I got there and I realized, we have all sorts of cool stuff. You know, ticky box, ticky box, ticky box, what? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, you know, they didn't have config management and that's okay because... I mean, it's actually kind of exciting from an ops point of view. If there is no config management, that means you get to make the config management happen. Yeah, I mean, there was some tooling in place, but we more or less got to implement config management from scorched earth, and it's just awesome, like really awesome. Yeah, it's really fun. And you might think like, oh, wait, you have all of the Dockers. Dockers replaces config management, right? Yeah, no. Docker does not replace config management. Um, because your Docker containers have to run somewhere, and those host instances are something that you probably want to, I don't know, configure, maybe manage. Um, and also, there are those instances. We have a lot of ephemeral instances. I think the average lifespan of one of our, uh, you know, www.dramafever.com nodes is about 18 hours. But we have plenty of instances that don't live like that. They live a lot longer. Those, those handcrafted, bespoke, artisanal snowflake servers that we all have in the dark corners of our infrastructure, those ones are kind of scary. They're absolutely terrifying. <laughs> and it was only last week that we had to rebuild one. Fortunately, spoiler alert, we had already chefed it, so this was a lot easier. <laughs> um, so then we said, okay, we need to get some configuration management. Uh, I was actually just starting to kind of plot out what I planned to do with Chef uh, when Peter got hired, and suddenly, dun dun dun. So, so our original orchestration tools were written in Python using Fabric, and so 
Ansible was an option, right? Maybe that's uh, an evil word to use here, but uh, it's an option, and I have to say that I was sort of rooting for it, and Bridget and I went back and forth, and we put all the options on the table, and to be perfectly honest, what swayed me at the end was the community. She pulled the community card out and said, look at all this, and I was like, well, I can't really argue with that. Exactly. And here we are. Um, and we actually, uh, I believe um, our, our boss, Tim Gross, had actually tasked us, we, we didn't actually listen to him, sorry, Tim, but he had actually tasked us with, uh, go build two fully functioning, you know, jet fighter prototypes, and Ansible one and a chef one. And we're like, yeah, let's not do that. Let's just build a chef one and have it be awesome. So we, yeah, we that got only you lasted past, for about a day. <laughs> <laughs> we got you past the stuff that you were concerned about with chef, um, just by kind of talking through some of the reasons that you were worried about using it. Exactly. So it's cooperation, not competition. And it's, you know, part of DevOps and it's great. And exactly. So we had to make some decisions right away. Going with hosted made a lot of sense because, you know, we run plenty of servers, but our core competency is not running a chef server or running chef server clusters. It's running a streaming video website. So something that we don't need to run and we can have Timberman or Ben R run for us is probably a time saver. Absolutely. Um, but though we did find as soon as we started looking at hosted that there was definitely and just like the getting started stuff the starter kit stuff had a and I don't know if it still does but at least in November I think when we were looking at this it had a terrifying button that said like here's the steps you should do and one of them is reset organization PEM and I'm like oh I don't want people in the organization right. doing that so like there were some things that we didn't do exactly you know by the book um, and then some of the concerns that you had around Chef were based around stuff like this. Do you want to talk about that? Exactly. So, you know, it's not uncommon to see people have three environment files, right? You'll have production, you'll have QA, and you'll have dev. Maybe you'll have a staging or something like that. Um, since, we, since we have multiple services, as we discussed in the beginning, we have Drama Fever, which is primarily a lot of our international content. We have Doc Club which are documentaries, and we have Shudder, which is the horror, we decided, we, we ended up with a production, a QA, and a dev environment for each one of those services. And the roles that we use are primarily just run lists. There's nothing in there. We try not to put attributes in there. And we'll explain later how we use those with our user data when uh, creating instances. And I think one of the main things you were worried about there, and you're right, is the lack of versioning with roles. Absolutely. I know, I know some people are like, roles are evil. And we're like, well, we don't think they're evil, but we don't want to shoot ourselves in the foot either. Absolutely. Um, and another place that we did find that we were shooting ourselves in the foot was actually with notifies. So. Yeah, so we started out with having notifies on... Everything, really. Um, so we had, you'll see YOLO, later that, right? <laughs> yeah, so, so you'll see later we use, we use an upstart uh, config to start Docker and, and to restart our Docker services. And that's a template. And we had a notify on that. So what would happen is, as you'd all expect, you know, who use Chef, if we change that template, our entire service is going to blip. We didn't want that. And if, if the Docker daemon restarts, as it turns out, that does terrible things to say the Jenkins, Jenkins server that the jobs are currently running on. Oops. So um, what we, we did end up, so some of that we had to evolve over time. We did end up like trying to define some stuff around our workflow even before we started using it just to get like some rules of how we wanted to do it. Uh, because hopefully, you know, we wanted to move towards more people than just us in the organization feeling comfortable using Chef. Right. And the first tool we gravitated towards was Chef DK. Um, I had previous experience with most of the components of Chef DK, but managing them ourselves, you know, using a gem file. And I have to say, Chef DK is amazing. Um, if you haven't checked it out, check it out. Um, and a uh, shout out to, I totally wish I could have gone to the talk right before this one, but I'll definitely watch it later. Uh, thank you, Fletcher Nichols, for Chef Ki yes, for touch thank you. Ah, Test Kitchen, because it's yeah, made it, life so much easier. Yeah, we, we combine Test Kitchen with uh, Kitchen EC2 as our plugin, and we spin up AWS instances uh, in, in, in place of, say, Vagrant instances or Docker containers uh, to do all our testing, and we use primarily BATS tests. Um, and the reason that that's useful for us is because we're not hybrid cloud or multi-cloud or anything like that. Since we're 100% in AWS, we're not writing recipes that are saying, and then, if it's not AWS, do this. Like, no, we want to actually test what's going to happen with actual EC2 attributes. So Exactly. Um, and we also uh, determined pretty early on that 
the, that thing that maybe some of you have experienced where there's a knife upload that occurs, but that cookbook, that version of the cookbook never gets to GitHub, and then maybe the person goes out of town, and then you're like, what's in source control, and what's actually on the chef server are not the same thing. Ah, like that's happened to me before. So um, when Peter suggested this workflow, I was like, what? This is fantastic. Yeah, I mean, Jenkins is our gatekeeper. So we have a Jenkins job that runs Food Critic, runs RuboCop, and if it passed those tests, it'll upload, you know, it'll upload the cookbooks, the environments, the roles, and all the necessary components you need to, uh, uh, to run Chef. And it works out phenomenally well for us because, I mean, how often, for those of you who use Food Critic or RuboCop, how often do you check before you actually push? <laughs> well, if that Jenkins job weren't catching us, I know, like, how many times, if we searched for, damn it, RuboCop in Slack, we, we would find a lot of those. Um, and Food Critic has actually been, uh, I mean, kind of a mixed bag. There's, I got to learn about some fun Food Critic related controversies out there on the mailing list, but at least, like, it's given us a little bit more assurance that we're putting things out there that we'd like. Uh, there's stuff that we're not doing yet, like we're not running Text Kitchen via Jenkins that we want to add. We just haven't had a chance yet. Exactly. But, um, so the, the Docker stuff that I suspect many of you are in the room for, uh, the, we, we both came into a Docker already in progress. Uh, Drama Fever's actually been running Docker in production, like in the production request path since October 2013. Um, and for a long time after that, I think the main thing on the Docker website was under no circumstances should you run this in production. Uh, so that was, you know, that's kind of fun. But um, the Docker images that we're using are being built via Docker files. We're not doing it exactly like the Disney folks were doing, though it's kind of interesting how some of the workflow is the same. Yeah, it is interesting. And, you know, I, I, I suppose I shouldn't be terribly surprised that people who love using Chef want to use Chef to build your Docker images. But we don't do it that way. Uh, we keep Docker files in uh, the various service repositories in GitHub, and they're built that way on Jenkins. Yeah, via Jenkins jobs. And that's been going on yep. since before we had Chef. And then our deployment process is push base, uses Fabric, um, which is which is imperfect, and we're certainly iterating on. But the key part is uh, it uses Upstart. So, Getting new code out is as simple as restarting the upstart job on a given server, and it goes and does a Docker pull of the thing that our deployment process has tagged as the current prod container. Um, so when we were trying to decide where to chef this, it was, I think probably a lot of people get to that place of like, okay, where do you start? Yeah, we, we had a blank slate, and you know, we're thinking, okay, you know, which services should end up in chef first? And of course, you know, like it says, visible wins are obviously important. We want to make sure that we can reduce uh, pain and friction that we're feeling. Mm -hmm. And and that brought us to a pretty obvious choice, actually. We're like, production. <laughs> jump right in. <laughs> Do production first. Because that's where some of the most manual steps that we had to do more frequently were. Um, specifically around the aforementioned auto-scaling. So this is an actual graph. Um, when it's... It's from, there's no numbers on it, because you know, numbers. But um, you can see it's from the last couple of days, and this is the count of healthy instances in our www.dramafever.com load balancer at any given time. So. Yeah, and, and this is where we decided to start, and it made the most sense. So, you know, we have this auto scaling for our service, and we're like, okay, ephemeral instances, we need to make sure that when an instance is created, that Chef provisions it. And we also want to make sure that when the instance is terminated, that it deregisters both the node and the client from the chef server to avoid cruft. Exactly. And the way that the instances in those launch configs were getting there, this is the container you should run type stuff before, was we had um, several hundred line user data files that were literally doing stuff like this, just like catting things into upstart jobs. Um, but we would have these for every one of our microservices. They were, I mean, when you sat down and started trying to, you know, templatize this, I mean, what did you find? Yeah, when, when I started, I was like, you know, I, you open the first template, and you're like, oh, this is what I need to create. Then you open the second template, and you're like, oh, well, they weren't a little, templates yet. Or, or, I'm, so, I'm sorry, yeah, configs. And you're like, oh, this is a little different. Then you open the third <laughs> one, you're like, oh, this is slightly different. And so forth and so forth. And so, you know, what Chefs gives us is a single source of truth. Yeah, exactly. And so instead of a whole bunch of disparate files like that, we're literally like 
taking an AMI that we're building, and obviously, we, I suppose we I think we realized later that we could just move that Chef Client Pem remove into the Packer stuff, Packer but mode, we'll yeah. talk about that later. So you can see that warts and all, this is the work in progress, but um, now we just say this is the role, and then when the instance comes up, it knows what it's supposed to be, and it gets that much more consistently. Right, and our role names, as I, as I mentioned earlier, are essentially just run lists, and the environments may or may not contain um, a few attributes, but it's mostly pinning. Yeah. Um, and then the deregistration mentioned as well. And this is one where we did end up doing some Googling and found some helpful blog post out there that was talking about Sensu that had some clues in this direction. We're not actually using Sensu, but this has, it had some clues in this direction, which is if your um, nodes stick around forever, your hosted chef bill is probably going to be a bit obnoxious. So. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, we just have the nodes deregister themselves when they're terminating, um, and just via dropping a you know a, a NRC, script. NRC script. Though exactly. we need to iterate on this because we found that our spot instances don't always get to that. Like I know Amazon just I see people nodding. They're like, yeah, Amazon just added a thing that gives you a two minute warning when a spot instance is going to be um, gotten rid of via pri for price related reasons. But sometimes they're not getting they're not being gotten rid of for price related reasons. Like sometimes they're scaling down just because of CloudWatch. So we we got to right. do a little bit more work on this. I think yeah, to this make technique sure that's works always happening most of the time. Yeah, which is pro it's it's probably fine. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so anyway, the, uh, it's very interesting to me that we have kind of a similar diagram to the one that the Disney folks were talking about in terms of our AMI factory. Yeah, I was, I was uh, surprised. They pulled out Packer. I thought we were going to be the ones to do that. Um, but anyway. It's awesome. Yeah, it is awesome. But um, yeah, so, so this was, this was the, um, the, the concept that we had, and we ended up building it. So uh, you know, from, your, from your local laptop, you would push to GitHub, as one does, and then Jenkins would read from the repository. And if you would pass your RuboCop and pass your food critic tests, it would get pushed out to Chef's server. Um, and Chef would communicate with the, our EC2 instances and uh, update. And then uh, Packer, similar to the, the Disney folks, uh, Packer will also pull from, from Chef and create our AMIs. And that's an on-demand service uh, from a Jenkins job. And the reason that we wanted this is because what we had before was literally AMI is being created by, you know, hand hacked. And then I, we got a, a shell script of sorts that was actually like history redirected into file.sh. Because, you know, we totally do that, right? But the problem with that is that, say, you edited a file in there, that's not going to be captured in your history redirect to file.sh. So we ended up with, we would sometimes create, we use the same base AMI for everything. Uh, and we would sometimes end up with a base AMI where we realized after we rolled it out that, oh, we screwed up something with NX log. I guess we're not going to be shipping any logs until we, make an, we hack together a new AMI. And it was a really painful and um, error-prone process. So it was really nice to be able to say, this is what our base cookbook looks like. And not only if you know the next shell shock comes along or whatever, not only can we push this out immediately, as one does, but we can also immediately create an AMI that's going to look exactly like that. Yeah, and the last part on this is the auto-scaling piece, which we're still in the, progress of, uh, in the process of working out. Um, so, for those of you who use AWS, uh, it would be creating new launch configurations uh, and populating it with user data, um, which might be something that Chef Provisioning can, can solve for us. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, we, we've looked at Chef Provisioning. There's pieces that we're doing now with the AWS JSON skeleton stuff because both Terraform and Chef Provisioning have really scary bugs in their GitHub issues right now. It's like, and then this goes wrong and your infrastructure goes kerflooey. I'm like, no, no, not happening. <laughs> Um, we did run into a couple of sort of amusing issues with our, uh, like, all of the, you know, base install stuff um, being in our chef runs. There was one day that our web server, like, the maindramafever.com site suddenly had a lot of unhealthy hosts. And I go and I look, and they're not even starting their registry container. We'll get to that in a minute. We probably should be talking faster or skipping stuff. I don't know. But they weren't starting their registry container, and they weren't starting the Django containers and Nginx containers they needed to be running because get.docker.io was down, and we foolishly had an, a dependency on an external package to install Docker. And so it was taking 20 minutes for these chef runs to complete, even though the AMI already had Docker installed on it. So it's like we didn't even need to be running that stuff at all. Like, we just needed to be running that stuff um, when creating the AMI. So we're like, okay, not doing that anymore. Oh, but. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, <laughs> we had to update all the AMIs in Test Kitchen as well, or add them to the run list in order to, to yeah, so allow that to work again. I mean, essentially the moral of the story here is, is sort of something that is common sense at this point is, <laughs> you know, if you're pulling from, you know, if you're pulling from various repositories around the web, occasionally they go down, right? And you can't. And we knew that, but we just didn't really think about it. But anyway, so deciding what to chef. I, we already talked about we're not making the images with Chef. Um, we also decided that maybe making the developers write the, um, the Django settings file in eRubis would be cruel and unusual, so we didn't do that. Right. <laughs> yeah, but Cause, because for our services, it, all of that configuration is in the Docker file itself. Um, but what we needed to do was we needed to deposit our images onto the various hosts, and we needed to start them as containers uh, for each service. Uh, which leads us to uh, essentially the heart of our upstart script, which is our docker run command. Uh, this is at the bottom of the of the script, and, and this is what starts our service. And so we needed to turn this into a template. And so this is a, the first pass at the template. Um, and uh, the problems that we ran into it are probably, the problems are pretty obvious. Yeah, so, so this is an example of the template. Um, if you want to click to the next. Yeah. And, and this is, this is the, the second portion of the template. Um, you know, you know er, uh, .erb files, it's totally cool. Um, but we ran into an issue because the first iteration of the lightweight resource provider that we wrote um, was built in such a way that we anticipated our infrastructure to exist in a certain way and we didn't make things explicit. Yeah, um, we have way too many hidden assumptions, but the problem was if you're running a uh, if you're running the www image, it may be with a Django container or a salary container or this admin container. And so we couldn't make the assumptions we originally thought we could make about what things were called. Right. And I, and I think this was a, one of the topics at the summit, which was really good, um, you know, sort of avoiding complexity in your cookbooks um, by not trying to create something that's too fancy. And as an example, like it might be like something if the lightweight resource provider name is such and such, then you know, we're going to have a bunch of if else is in there and we're going to, you know, put that into, you know, we're going to put that as the, the Docker image name or potentially the Docker tag. And it, lead, it led to a whole bunch of stuff like this, which was just really terrible because we came back to work on our, our, our lightweight resource provider a few months later and we're like sifting through this being like, I can't even read this. And I wrote it. We don't even know, what, we didn't even know what we were doing there. So um, refactoring it to basically just use attributes was like incredibly better. Yeah, be explicit, moral of the story, just so much easier. And this is what an example of one of our lightweight resource providers in uh, one of the recipes looks like now. Uh, as you can see, everything's extracted out into attributes. Um, and we, I'm sorry, I'm moving past that a little bit yep. quickly, but yep, um, we also like, all the talk of community cookbooks, like community cookbooks are wonderful and we love them. And we also wanted to make sure that we did the hopefully standard thing of not taking a community cookbook and hacking on it, but instead writing a wrapper cookbook for any kind of, you know, customization or changes we needed just because uh, otherwise it makes it really hard to upgrade. Yeah, wrapper cookbooks for the win. I mean, for those of you who have, who have edited a community cookbook and then later realized that you wanted to upgrade it because it has new features that you want only to realize that you have to merge all this stuff and everything has changed, yeah. you totally understand this. Yeah. Um, okay, so for example, for a Jenkins server, uh, Jenkins again is where a lot of our, you know, our Docker, it will, all of our Docker images are being created. Um, so it's, it needs specific recipes to install things to do that, to do all of the builds, um, to put in all of the Python wheels or, you know, the, all the pip stuff that we need and whatnot. Um, and it also, because this is a piece of our infrastructure that's not ephemeral and isn't scaling up and down, it actually needs its disk to be configured differently and even its Docker registry to be different. Um, yeah, so which taught us another lesson, um, as many of you might have in your orgs, a uh, base cookbook, right, that has everything that all of your nodes need. It turns out that you run into ones that don't need it or need to have things changed. So this was yeah. something we had to work out later on, such as changing the, the Docker, the, the private registry. Right, so like the, for example, um, our private registry, when we're, we also, we run a local um, S3 backed registry. We can just give you, give you a couple of slides that show you a little bit more about that. We're not gonna, we're not gonna go into too much detail about it. Um, but 
that starts from an upstart job. It goes and gets that config.yaml to know which file it needs. Um, on our Jenkins server, the config.yaml needs to have a different access key because we don't want to accidentally do a Docker push to our private registry from something that we maybe built ourselves to test. Yeah, because as, as I mentioned earlier, Jenkins is our gatekeeper, and that is also the case for Docker. All of our, all of our Docker images are pushed up only through Jenkins. Um, and so, for example, we, hey, we, in the past, when people would rebuild the Jenkins server within a hand-hacked way, sadness, badness. Um, this time, when we had to rebuild the Jenkins server in, you know, a, everything is on fire sort of way, Chef made that so much easier. Oh, the Packer stuff. A little bit of detail about that, maybe. Yeah, so we, we copied in um, some of our, our, our Packer build here. I thought people might be interested in this. Uh, so we use Packer to build our AMIs. We pull from Chef. And as you can see, there's a variety of different variables that you have to provide it. Um, but it's a really great option if you need to create snapshots or images and you use Chef. Yeah. And um, something about, so in this is uh, similar to the stuff that Brian from Disney was discussing. Uh, we actually like have Packer doing that Chef client run, and that's why in our user data, and we probably here could just add that remove in the same script, but right. you know, uh, iteration. It's an iterative process. Um, but yeah, so Chef is basically exactly what's configuring our images via Packer. Uh, and something else to keep in mind, complete digression from Chef land, but something you want to know if you decide to use Packer in AWS, the default permissions that Packer.io says to give your um, Packer builder are diabolically uh, open. So <laughs> we ended up restricting them quite a lot. We were like, we don't really want this being able to terminate any instances it wants. That yeah. seems like a bad choice. Yeah, it was a really fun afternoon because on, <laughs> on Packer's documents, it's basically like, oh, you know, just give, give, it, it, all the give, permissions. It, give it everything. Give it everything. It's probably fine. Yeah, it'll probably be fine. And we, we essentially went through, you know, all these different policies trying to figure out. And the, the crux here is essentially the condition at the bottom because Packer by default calls the node Packer Builder. And that's what ended up working for us. Um, so if you end up in this situation, check out this slide. It'll help you out. We will be putting these online later. So, um, yeah, so we, we mentioned that our Jenkins server kind of caught fire in a fiery blaze of sadness. Um, and that probably would have been a terrifying prospect uh, even, you know, I don't know, a few weeks before when we hadn't actually chefified it and we were almost ready to cut over anyway. Yeah, I mean, thankfully, you know, we had proper backups of most of the important information and we had Jenkins in Chef 90% complete, so it wasn't as painless as it could have been, for sure. Or as painful. Pain <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah. Um, and the Jenkins server is actually, uh, Jenkins itself is something that we're actually installing from the Jenkins cookbook, as mentioned earlier, not in a container. Like, it doesn't run inside a container. But a great deal of our um, non-ephemeral, non-request non path infrastructure actually was containerized last summer before we started. And one of the things we realized, this is just kind of a diagram of what our monitoring and alerting infrastructure looks like. And all of this, except for the obvious stuff we don't run, is running inside containers right now. And some of that is not for the best, like graphite. Yeah, and you know, um, certainly there are people who would disagree with me, but I don't think graphite should run in a container. Ours currently does, and we're working on a process to pull it out. Right, because you shouldn't necessarily containerize, like, don't containerize all the things. Containerize the things where having it be containerized is gonna be a win for you. I mean, it's like, Docker is not the PHP hammer. Like, you shouldn't use it for everything. Um, and, uh, on the other hand, I mean, there, there are things like Sentry that when we, it is containerized for us, and that ends up being really useful when we wanted to, you know, completely rebuild, like move our Sentry server from one AWS account to another and completely rebuild it. It was really simple to just, you know, this is just one of the, obviously Sentry has a UDP listener and it has a web interface and it has like a database talking. So there's several of these. But um, this you'll note is actually, I wanted to show this one because this is actually using the early version of our, um, our LWRP. Hence the overrides. And you, you can see here where, oh, so this is actually used in prod, but for whatever reason, the Sentry container is tagged, or the container image is tagged with dev because reasons. Um, and so like we did end up having to hand hack in so many of these overrides, which is why that was kind of a horrible pain. 
Yeah, and this also, you know, describes how creating a lightweight resource provider with a template that's the single source of truth had really helped us out because with all the variety of services, we created separate cookbooks for each one. I mean, we could have made an upstart template in every single one of those cookbooks, and we would be right back where we started needing to update each one. But using the lightweight resource provider made everything great. Right. And something else to, to bring up with the, with the whole, you know, go, go gadget DevOps, DevOps cooperation stuff. Um, I mean, we're both doing ops, but we want our um, dev team members to be involved in our stuff we're doing with Chef as well. And one of the places it's really helpful right away is, um, for example, if they want to change a cron job in production, maybe they've added something new and exciting. Um, in the past, they would check it into GitHub, and it would hopefully get hand added to a prod, you know, cron tab somewhere by hand at some point, maybe, or maybe not, or maybe it would be in GitHub, but then the stuff that was in prod had actually been changed by hand at one point. Because again, your cron tab, not inside a container. This is the stuff that, even if you have all of the Docker, you still need to manage. Yeah, and it also can give you visibility, um, especially if a lot of your configuration is sort of dispersed throughout uh, your repositories, and they can all be put into Chef, and everyone knows where to look for things. Um, so this is, this is basically, it, it really feels like we finished something, and then we're like, and now we have to refactor that, because now we figured out that that's not entirely right. Um, and it just, it keeps being an iterative process, and that's actually fine. Like, I feel like we, we're almost six months into, because we started this right about when you came on board, so we're almost six months into this, and um, have, I think, just scratched the surface of what we can do in terms of making our chef stuff and our Docker stuff work well together. Yeah, I mean, as far as putting chef throughout our entire infrastructure, we're about, you know, 95% complete, but that doesn't mean we have to stop. I mean, iteration is part of the game and make things better. Mm -hmm. And, um, and on that note, like, uh, some of the pieces that we've, like, we've, we have almost all of product, almost all of production is currently managed by Chef. Uh, we actually, while the two of us are out of town at ChefConf, um, this week, uh, a couple other members of our ops team are actually moving all of dramafever.com from classic EC2 to, um, VPC, which includes, uh, cause you know, that's what you do when you're short staffed on your app team, yeah. ops team, right? Why not? Um, and we actually heard yesterday, I think, from our boss that uh, because of the stuff we had already done with Chef, that it's been almost entirely painless. I think there was one instance that had a cookbook problem and everything else, like tear down, stand back up, site didn't even go down, everything was fantastic. Yep, new user data with the roles and the environments worked seamlessly. Because mm -hmm. again, if you're, if you're reinstantiating your entire infrastructure in AWS, this was not a case of like snapshot and move. It was, a, it was a case of take the user data from Chef, put it into the new launch configs for the um, over in VPC, try to stand them up and see if they come up right. And everything did, which was which is fantastic. Yeah, it makes me feel great that <laughs> all the Chef work we did worked. <laughs> makes me feel a lot less guilty about being away at a conference while they were working on that, let me yeah, tell you. Too. Um, so yeah, this is basically like, I don't know, a happy story of... I think there's, there's a prevailing myth out there that um, containers replace configuration management, and I think that couldn't be further from the truth. I think they're complementary, and um, while there's certainly some overlap in the use cases, there's also a great deal of uh, value that we've seen, at least at Drama Fever, from putting Docker and Chef together in our infrastructure that we didn't have with Docker alone. Right, yeah, and, and ultimately it's about implementation, right? But, you know, for our use case, the two work really, really well together. Yeah, so, so that's, that's it. That's our talk. Um, thank you for listening, and I don't know how much time we have for any questions or whatnot, but, uh, but yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. We have about five minutes for questions. All right, and we have about five minutes for questions. Hopefully a mic is being brought to people. We really can't see the audience at all, so we're just going to trust that when they hand a mic to someone and let them talk, it, it happens. Okay, hi. Hi. Thanks for the talk. Um, my question is, how do you monitor processes through Docker? Yeah, that, that's a really good question. And um, we alluded to it briefly, I think. And uh, maybe we didn't even say anything about it, though it was on a slide. Uh, we actually mount our logs um, from inside the container out to the host instance and let NXLog pick them up and ship them to uh, Logstash. 
So in that way, we can actually keep an eye on, you know, the errors and whatnot. We also use CloudWatch. So usually if PagerDuty is telling us that something, there's something wrong, it's because CloudWatch says our rate of 500 errors has increased. Um, we don't spend a lot of time, we kind of subscribe to the cattle not pets thing. So we don't spend a lot of time caring if a specific instance is unhealthy. Like I said, most of these instances live about 18 hours. So if there is a process on, um, in a container, on a, a host instance that dies, shrug. Yeah, like, and, depending on this, and depending on the service, we have Sentry and Graphite as well. So we're getting application you know, data from, from that as well. But as far yeah. as logging, it comes through the volume mounting with Docker. But yeah, so in terms of the, lo the monitoring, alert, alerting, and logging stuff, we spend a lot more t time caring about the um, host. The, well, the, the business level, um, application level errors, as opposed to this particular host has something wrong with it or this particular process isn't running. Like, we just, we don't spend a lot of time focusing on that. Why was uh, Graphite not a good match for Docker? Um, so Graphite's pretty I.O. intensive. And so when you add more abstraction, uh, it ends up being slower than it should be. And so our, the graphite like write queue ends up, and we've seen this, like our write, our write queue ends up being larger than we want it to be, which means if anything goes wrong with that graphite instance, and we have one right now, um, we're looking at a cluster, a graphite cluster solution, yeah. but we haven't had a chance to implement that and, yet. And, and, and with, you know, with graphite, I mean, it depends on how you do it. If you're, if you're gonna run your carbon caches and your carbon relay and you wanna run everything inside a single container, I'd say it's a really bad idea because then you have to have something there that's, that's controlling them like Supervisor D or something like this. I think we have uh, Bucky right now yeah. implemented before our time. It's kind of terrible. Yeah, and, but, but you know, maybe to answer your question a little better, I think like if, if you're able to create, a, uh, if you're able to create a, a graphite image where all of those services are independent and you can still use the volume mounts to persist your data for like the whisper files, I think you could still probably get away with it, but you're really kind of adding complexity to the, to the problem. Right, like it's, it's a question of what are you getting from it. Like for Logstash, for example, for Logstash Forwarder, when we've had um, our, the Redis instance that Logstash is using um, back up and be full of stuff that we'd like to flush, spinning up a lot more Logstash Forwarder containers makes that go faster and gets the stuff into Elasticsearch faster. So that is one piece of Logstash that's actually pretty useful to containerize. Right. Um, and we might consider keeping Elasticsearch in a container just because I don't know about you, but I really don't like spending that much time with JVM stack traces. So no, no. it's like uh, when there's a lot of complicated Java stuff and you can just kind of bundle it up and not care about it, I I'm good with that. Um, but yeah, so there's some pieces that we found that we're not necessarily getting anything out of having them in a container, like our Logstash indexer. We're not gonna run more than one for the, you know, the way we're currently set up, so. I think we've got time for one more question over here. Um, is this, oh, sorry. Uh, so uh, with the upstart templates, are you using uh, settings files within the containers or passing along the environmental variables? So we do, we do both. Um, so the, the actual configuration files are inside the image, right? And we will have a config file for QA, for dev, right? So everything's packaged in that image and the image is just tagged differently depending on uh, which environment it's in. And then we use environment variables passing the dash E flag to, ch like to essentially tell uh, which, you know, tell it which one it's going to use, right? Are you using the dev config or are you using the prod config? And also, even though we do tag the stuff, like, you know, dot club prod or whatever, in reality, it's the exact same dub 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 prod um, image, like same, same shaw, like it's the same image. So this is something that works for us because we're controlling the horizontal and the vertical, so we don't care if we ship a config file uh, for every single one of our sites on that image and then just choose the one we're gonna use. Um, if we were some sort of more multi-tenancy where like customers, like clients had control over something to do with their image, we wouldn't be able to do that. The fact that we're running and controlling the platform gives us that flexibility. And that's about all we have time for. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you.